syllabus review. Let's get at it. This stuff, if you showed up the first day of class, you probably already know, but it's got to be in there. This is for your enjoyment. We will be using an OER, Open Educational Resource, so you don't have to buy any textbooks this year. I'm part of a pilot program. I have I really like the idea of students not paying for books. I will let, I will be happy if you check out my blog where I, I really think this is important. The price of education has skyrocketed in the last 10, 15 years. You don't have to buy books. Everything is free. It's electronic. And if you're interested in a paper copy of the book, talk to me and uh, I'll see what I can do. A lot of this stuff, if you're using this as a text, you don't have to print off the syllabus. If you want to, uh, and you can print for free somewhere else, do it. I expect you to put in at least as much work as I put in. I, I will meet your efforts. So people that work harder, I will work harder to help them succeed. And people who don't care, well, that's no skin off my nose. If you're going to miss class, you know you anticipate an absence, I would like to know about it. I've had students give birth to in class. I've had several that didn't miss a couple classes, and that's all. They talked to me in advance, and we worked together. And I've had a, a couple spontaneous births where... Evidently, they either did not know they were pregnant, or they just didn't think they had to tell me. Now, in one of these cases, it was online, and maybe they thought it wasn't relevant, but then they couldn't get online while they were in the hospital, and there were complications. And had we communicated just a little bit, had they just given me a minor heads up about a predictable predictable challenge in the classroom this semester, we could have uh, succeeded, and they wouldn't have to pay to take the class twice. But if you know you're going to miss class, let me know. Likewise, if you're in any clubs, organizations, athletics, or anything else, yeah, officially the college doesn't say you can miss class, but I'll work with you. But I had guys in some club that just would miss every Friday, and, well, it's a school organized activity. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you can miss every class and not have consequences. And according to the syllabus, you miss five classes for any reason, boom, you're gone. Just because you're in student senate doesn't mean you can just skip class and Let's face it, in both of these cases that are coming to mind, it was a bullshit story that they used in order to not come to class, and they thought, I had to accept it. I've been around. I've been teaching 25 years. I have a deviant mind sometimes. I, I look for loopholes as a student, and as faculty, I, I know how the devious students think because... I was one of the all. Of course, I got kicked out of college a couple times, so I know how that works, too. This will be updated as we go along, so if anything's not working or needs to be, I will deal with it. And this is all basic kind of stuff. FERPA, I can't just talk about your grades in front of other people. I can't talk, answer questions about your grades or performance in class over the phone. And if it's not a student email through stumail.jcc.edu, I won't talk about what you're doing or how you're doing in class, because... Someone else might be listening, and that would be a violation of the law. Not only is it a violation of the law, it's extra work for me. So there's two real good reasons why it ain't going to float. So if you got to talk about your grade, you're concerned about your grades, you don't think something was fair, you think I made a mistake on your grades, some mistakes happened, come talk to me in my office. By the way, from the time this class is scheduled to start, either 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, depending on the, grade you're, the class you're enrolled in, from 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock until 15 minutes after that hour, it's class time. I don't talk about individual student performance like, oh, man, I'm going to miss a class. Tell me after class. Tell me before class. Tell me during office hours. That would be better. But don't take up class time to talk about your own issues because it's our time, right? I'll try not to, you know, complain about personal issues on your time because it's our time. Now, about classroom behavior, there's some silly stuff in here, okay? Responsible use of cell phones. Yes, you're adults, and I expect you to behave that way. And you may think that you're going to get a job where you can, like, pull out your phone whenever you feel like it, during meetings, during interviews with clients, during sales pitches. The truth is, no, you don't. You, you need to learn to responsibly use your phone. During the first 10 to 15 minutes, I try not to lecture more than that. Sometimes it'll happen that I go over, but... Really, I focus on explaining stuff the first 10, 15 minutes, and then I try not to talk so much. I, after that, I, I try to respond to questions or have you working in groups or doing something that's relevant to our course goals and objectives. <clears throat> but when I, if I'm standing up talking, don't look at your phone, all right? 
I ask you please to turn your phones off, at least put them on silent, stick them in a bag out of reach, off your desk. I don't want you looking at your phone during class. I see you doing that. After I'm done, if I'm sitting on my desk and you're in group work, I and mean, the desks and the phones are on your I, I don't still think they should be on your desk. Responsible use of cell phones and such. About public displays of affection, I've had some weird stuff happen in my last 10 years at this school. And including, but not limited to, what's listed right here. And uh, wet willies. You know what a wet willy is? Who does that? That's gross. And then I tried to deal with this crap and they said, is it in your syllabus? Should it really have to be in my syllabus that you can't lick your fingers, stick it in somebody's ear? Exchange of bodily fluids is now explicitly prohibited in my class with a zero strikes policy, okay? Any exchange of bodily fluids in my class, don't let the door hit you or the good Lord split you. I'm serious. I'm On my 10th year, I become full professor next semester. That'll make me a silverback. I can assert myself here. Also, let's tr call each other, let's address each other with terms of respect. No, I have no bullying through improper use of names. If someone says they want to be called by a name, if it's respectful, I don't care if it's accurate. If you you want to go by your middle name, that's fine. If, you know, your name is you know, Elizabeth, but you want to go by Monica because you've, I don't know, I don't care as long as you explain it. And, well, you don't have to explain it either. Just when I ask for a name, what do you want to be called? You tell me and then we'll do it. I will not call anyone by a term that is demeaning or degrading. You can't say, call me trash, because I had someone's I want to be called garbage. That was my name. That was, that happened in class. No, I won't do that. Fatty Matty? Nope, I will not call you that. I will not say that out loud. In addition to anything conventionally considered a slur or derogatory, we don't call people cucks, libs, hippies. If, if I have to add to this list, I will. But, you know, treat each other with respect. Now, for me personally, there is pretty much nothing you can call me that I haven't heard before. And to be honest, I used to not react when people said disrespectful shit to me. But what I've discovered is that when I let people do, uh, call me Dixon or anything disrespectful or hey, you, you know, it's, professor, you don't have to remember my name. I don't care that much if you can't say my name. But professor, that works. We all like that. But if I let people get away with these little microaggression bullshit things, well, it affects how other students engage with the class. It is negative. It's a drag on my class. And if they get away with that stuff with me, they do similar and, and worse stuff to other people. And that's my logic. If there's an issue with this, I'll be happy to discuss it before or after class. Yeah, and if you do fall asleep in class, you'll be gent gently woken up and sent to a couch or sofa somewhere else. But you're not sleeping in class. And that's only happened once, and it was pretty much intentionally passive-aggressive. Page 8. The majority of work done in college takes place out of the classroom. You should expect to do a couple hours of homework for every hour you have in class. That's what everyone expects. That's the way it's always been. In fact, I think mm, they might say that it's more than two hours. But if I can get at least an hour, hour and a half out of you outside of class, anything I suggest you read, you should read. Anything I ask you to watch or suggest you watch, you should watch. You can take a book and read sections of it you like. You don't have to read the whole thing, but dedicate a couple hours outside of class for every hour in class. Now, this thing about digital names, file names. When you save as, you name your files, uh, your name, like, for example, I would be Greg D. or G. Dixon, and then the name of the specific assignment, dot, and we're going to do a literacy narrative, one of our first couple of papers. So for that example, it would be G. Dixon dot literacy narrative dot, I often put the date because I'll have multiple copies on multiple devices, and it gets confusing if you don't have them. But often people just save as, and they do let the machine decide for them, and it's like the first word, and it's like, Essay. If I get 50 essays and I save them to the same folder, I end up with one essay, the most recent one. Anything that causes me aggravation, that makes my life harder, well, your, your grade will suffer. I'm not punishing you, but you're not learning, and that your grades should reflect learning or the lack thereof. And maybe I do it because if you try to make my life harder, I will reward you. Don't spam me. Respect email. If you have a question during class, raise your hand. All right? If you're terribly shy, you can ask me to you know, raise your hand. I'll come to your desk, and you can... If you can't talk, we got to work on that. If you have any um, crippling anxiety or reasons you can't talk or learning disabilities, I've had them all, and I've actually got a Ph.D. in education. I've taken classes in how to help individual students with all manner of challenges. 
communicate that with me, and I'll find ways to make it work. But don't email me during class about a question you have in class because I'm not going to reply. And it's, that's just extra work for me, and it's against learning. It's right there says it all. Email should re augment face-to-face -face communication, not replace it. Don't email me homework. We turn it in on Canvas, learning management system. I don't discuss your grades in class. I don't care if you don't care about what your grade is. I'm not going to talk about your grades. I can get in trouble for it. That's the FERPA thing. So if you want to talk grades, come to my office hours, arrange. I will. There's a lot of times I'm on campus outside of office hours. Talk to me about when we can talk privately, and I will talk privately about your grades, but not in the presence of any other student. I've said this on the podcast, but if you get five absences, I will drop you. You will be warned ahead of time through campus email, but if you're not coming to class, almost every challenging or difficult narcissistic psychopathic student I've had has missed a lot of classes. And, and it's a way to document that you're not really engaged. There's something else going on. Now, if you've got a health issue or any really good reason, talk to me. I've got a Dropbox in Canvas that talks about anticipated absences. Be mature. Be responsible. Give me a heads up. That's a private way to let me know if there's some, you know, some sort of issue. That if you're an athlete, you've got a schedule when you could be out of class. Give that to me. I'll work with you. I'll work with you, but you need to tell me in advance. You can't tell me after the fact. That, but expect to go to class. If you miss more than three classes, statistics show you're not going to make it. So I actually give you a little more cushion than what is recommended by experts. Late work. I don't like if it's homework. If it's a homework grade, I don't take late work. If it's one of the four to six required essays, yeah, I got to accept that according to the college. But I dock 10% per calendar day. So after five days, the highest possible grade you get is 50%. And after seven days, I won't accept it, and you might as well drop the class because you, I will not accept any formal essay after seven days. And, and you think about it. For every essay we have due, there are multiple drafts that we do. We start it in class. So if you don't have anything to turn in by deadline, let's face it, you haven't been participating in class. You've been goofing off. You've been distracting other people. If you don't have anything to turn in on a deadline, it's not just the dog ate my homework. It's I haven't done anything in the last two weeks, and I haven't started, and I have no intention of starting. Oh, and look at this right here, highlighted. Don't have an earphone hang. I, you know, I don't know if you think you're cool listening to music while you're in class, but... I've noticed a correlation with people not knowing what's going on and having computers or laptops or phones open in front of them and earphones hanging out of their ears. There's just a really outrageously high correlation. And, you know, that Bluetooth earphone head thing that was popular a while back. Yeah, not only do you look like an idiot, and you do. Not, not an idiot. You look immature. And you might think it's cool, but it's not as cool as you think it is. But, no, I'll ask you nicely once, and if you can't get the hang of taking your earphones out of your head after two recommendations, this is one of those. If anything that repeats three times, I document it, and you may have to go talk to Paul Kyle, Dean of Students, because it becomes any mistake repeated three times is a choice. All of these behavioral things that are listed in the syllabus, well, they document disruption, really. They document maladjusted behavior. And I have strategies to deal with that without losing my temper, without raising my voice, without losing my cool, you know. Some people want to get under my skin. It doesn't work. You know, that doesn't mean it'll be allowed either. Because, again, I've put up with stuff that doesn't really, that I can live through. But I've learned that, and I've been thinking about this, and really, if you're disrupting class, trying to get under my skin, you're distracting, you're, uh, you're taking away from learning for everyone else. So it's not about me. It's about the class. The thing about the earphone, it doesn't bother me. Why can't I have an earphone in my ear? You're, you're sending a powerful message that you don't give a hoot. And you know what? That encourages other people to not care either. Or if they think, oh, he's cool. He doesn't give a This isn't high school. And that's why you don't call me Mr. Dixon. This isn't high school. Yeah, I work with disabilities and ADA. I've got training in dyslexia, ADD, ADHD, all kinds of learning disabilities. If you got that, let me know, and I will coordinate with Access Services. I mean, yes, you can keep that a secret, but it's not in your best interest. And some of my best students have been dyslexic. It doesn't doesn't limit your intelligence or your ability to contribute. Everything should be 12-point font times New Roman or Calibri. If it's on paper, it should be Times New Roman, which is a serif font. If it's online, Calibri, which is a sans serif font. Let me show you how that works. See? The C here 
it's just clean with no serif. But the T has the hanging down things. Those are serifs. It's easier to see serif font on paper, and it's easier to see sans serif font online. So there's a, there's a method to my madness. And I can't see 11-point font without my reading glasses, which pisses me off. And you don't want me pissed off when I'm reading, reading your work, okay? There's no advantage to that. You want me in a good mood when I'm evaluating your work, you get better grades. If I have to go looking for my reading glasses, I'm going to be in a good mood. And you don't want that. If anything bigger than 12-point makes you look like a child. Oh, and by the way, if you use Comic Sans font, you'll be humiliated, okay? It's just not right. Everyone's got to come to the final exam. That's a rule. Expect to come. It's easy in my class. Basically, you get 50 points just for showing up. Email is not for submitting homework. I will not open and read email attachments unless I have requested them specifically, and that doesn't happen often. Anybody who sends me an assignment through email rather than through Canvas, either just demonstrating that they don't follow directions, they're incapable of understanding written and spoken instruction, or they there are nefarious reasons as well, often involving plagiarism, which is addressed later in the syllabus. Keep copies of all your work, and every time you do a rough draft in class, keep it on Google Drive. There is no legitimate excuse for not having work to turn in when deadlines are due. It's on my computer at home is the modern version of my dog at my homework. Put it on Drive. If it's on Drive, Anywhere you have access to the internet, you have access to your work. I have had people tell me my computer build up, blew up, and it just doesn't matter. It's either in or it's not in. It's either turned in or it's not turned. Well, I'm repeating myself. Uh, I don't care about your stories. I, you know, I, it's either in or it's not. There's, you don't get points for good excuses. Otherwise, you know, some of you are quite creative. And as much as I'm, I've just heard it before. This is stuff we're going to do. Points matrices. Um, I might I haven't done this activity for a while, but it's worth reading, the difference between work and school. Most people who drop out of class say that it's because of work or time management, and learning how to deal with that, being aware of the, ch the challenges of doing two th these two things is really important for your success, and I want you to succeed. I, I really feel good when people make it, and I feel a sense of loss when people f drop out or, or, or stop showing up. Read about the difference here between high school and college because people, I think, in work, the biggest reason for people not succeeding in the first three months of a job, and most people who get fired, they get fired in the first three months. The biggest reason is a misunderstanding of expectations, and expectations are different in college than they are in high school. And I have several things included in my syllabus to address that difference in expectations. Please read it. you got to manage your own time. I'm not going to tell you when your homework's due. I'll tell you you have homework when it's due, but then you're expected to keep track of that. So if you ask me, do we have anything due this weekend? I hate that question because I don't know what you have to do. I teach five different classes. I mean, I organize this stuff online. I use Canvas. It's written down somewhere. Check where it's written down. I keep my lesson plans in a, in a Google slide presentation, and it has links and dates, and so they'll review. Look at the lesson plans. They're very detailed, actually. In high school, teachers, it's all getting you on the same page. They tell you what you're supposed to think. They give you facts, even where really they're not facts sometimes. The teachers will make connections. They'll explain you how you should think. But in college, I expect you to think about and synthesize things that might not seem related. For example, I have you look into subjects such as China. China, and there's reasons for that. Our school has spent has received millions of dollars to include Chinese culture and history into our, our curriculum. I also like to talk about sustainability, and I look at issues through a sustainability lens. Now, I like to talk about China and sustainability. What's the connection? Well, if I tell you, it, it's not really, you don't really learn. You know, you might remember it, but you have to do, try, it, it doesn't, you're not thinking. You're not, you're not learning how to think. You're just memorizing, and it's not about memorization. It's about learning how to learn. It's harder to find connections between things that may not seem connected. Oh, by the way, if you don't think China and sustainability are, re are related, did you know that between 30 and 45 percent of the air pollution in California comes from China? Yeah, that's only the beginning. There's a lot of connections, but again, we'll, we'll, we'll cut, cover some stuff that, may, that, that, that help you to think. I want you to learn how to learn. Sometimes you do work that doesn't get graded. Last semester, I had a great a project that uh, the, the team-based learning. It actually was a brilliant learning activity. 
but it didn't turn out to be the 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 way points came out. It it, it wasn't fair to everyone, and if I can't be fair to everyone, I might not count that as a grade. It might not get graded. If I'm just overwhelmed at the end of the semester when it comes to time turning grades, comes to turning in grades, it's possible it won't get graded. Now, I English classes, comp one in particular, we have lots of grades. Everyone, it's it's a hard class to teach. It's it's a bear to take, too. That's why it's called a, a gateway course. In my day, we called it a gatekeeper course because if you couldn't pass Comp 1, you couldn't make it through college. You couldn't get into other classes. We think of it now more as we want you to succeed, so we call it a gateway. If you can make it through Comp 1, you can succeed in other classes. We teach you the skills needed to survive in college using sources. Results count. It's not just effort. I don't... Yeah, you may work harder than anyone else or you've ever worked before, but the rest here are handouts I may hand out during class in the semester. If you want to read them in advance, fine. If you want to, if you have questions about them, you can ask me about them. Points are different now. I don't do, I still do the literacy narrative and the, the natural narrative, but instead of one being worth 60 points and one being worth 100, we do multiple drafts of each paper, and then I give you 100 points for whichever one you want to turn in for a grade. You have to do both draft drafts and second drafts of each of these assignments. But the points are different. I should take the points off the syllabus. Natural narrative is one of the most fun stories you'll ever write uh, or read. You get to learn stories from other people. It's a lot of fun. Journals. I've done blogging. I've done journals for 20 years, 25 years probably. And I've been doing blogging for the last 10 years, but I'm rethinking how I do blogging. It's it's one of the least popular activities with my students. Uh, research, and I may share this with you later, but research shows that students are terrible judges of their learning. Class evaluations, teacher evaluations, do not correlate with student success. So a lot of very popular teachers don't really help students learn. Even though writing everyday journals may seem like busy work and you may hate it. It actually affects learning, but I'm going to de-emphasize it a little bit or imagine it in a new way. This is still, there's some stuff that's worth reading here. I use the syllabus. The syllabus doesn't use me. A lot of the stuff is flexible, and if it can change, we will make adjustments to it. Syllabi are being used more and more. They're being treated like a contract. I think it's really more of an end-user licensing agreement. We've had I mean, 45 pa 40 pages for a syllabus is outrageous. When I was in college, they were two pages long. They were manageable. And you kept that in your backpack, and you, you referred to it throughout the semester. But now every time there's a new legal question, that my administration makes me put stuff. There's stuff in here that I, I don't see the point of. Why is it in the syllabus? But I have to, or lose my job, put it in my syllabus. For example, here at the end, this stuff about what to do in an emergency. I mean, come on. If there's a fire, are you really going to pull out your syllabus and read it? If people are saying, get to safety, you know, come this way, listen to them. Don't stop what you're doing in the middle of a fire or active shooter and look for the syllabus. But, okay, the information is here. You read it in advance. That's great. But if you got questions, by all means, please do ask. All right, and it's a conversation I'd be happy to have on the second day. But I, I don't like talking about syllabi in class. I unless I'm answering questions. So read it.